So I'm going to talk about accountability in EduLark. Uh, strangely, uh, as it may seem, uh, these, this is like the lecture that I'm probably the most stressed about every year. Uh, because there's so much to say, and I want to say it all. But uh, I've made a selection, and uh, uh, let's see how that works. And then uh, if you have questions, feel free to come to me afterwards and ask me. Even though I look tired and grumpy, because I, I have that look, I guess, sometimes. <laughs> but usually I'm pretty friendly. I'll tell you if I'm really angry and grumpy. So, uh, a few things about me. Uh, I own and I run a, a company called Urukroke AS. Uh, uh, Urukroke, you know the crowbird? You know? So the crowbird will come in and say, rah, rah. that's the kind of company I have. Um, <laughs> I've worked uh, offshore and internationally since 2002. I, uh, uh, like the opposite of Miriam. Uh, I'm, I'm working with adults and sometimes with, uh, uh, with children, whereas Miriam does the other thing around. Uh, and also, I love sailing. So if anyone is planning a sailing LARP, then come on, uh, I'd be happy. Yeah, oh yes, that's good. Um, so uh, uh, inspired by Arlen, I also included a photo of myself. <laughs> uh, and this is me working in Mumbai, in India, last week. And if you can see, this shirt is the same shirt. <laughs> I have washed it since then, um, at least once. Yeah. Yay, I'm getting compliments for washing my things. That's good. So, oh, wait, no, no, oh, no. I pressed the wrong button. No, no, what an idiot. <laughs> but I saved the day. So. There are two questions when we're talking about accountability in EduLARP. And that's obviously, what is an EduLARP? And what is accountability? And on my own account, I have cl cleared this with the organizers, I've also added a third thing I want to talk about. And that is, also, shit happens. <laughs> and I say that as a joke, but it's quite serious, because sometimes shit does happen. We'll talk about that last. So. How does the EduLARP differ from regular LARPs? Um, last year we, we came up with like, three key things that differ from regular LARPs. It's that it's commission, so somebody is paying you to do it. A school is saying, we need this EduLARP, or a business is saying, we need this EduLARP. So there's someone who owns you, and that's a difference. Um, there is an explicit learning goal, like you want to learn something, and usually it's mandatory. So you have to go there even though you might not want to be there. Uh, Miriam was talking about the 16-year-old uh, 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 students yesterday sitting a little bit like cool, and I don't know how to do cool, but uh, <laughs> something like that, I don't know. Uh, they will sit coolly in their seats and be very you know, sort of uh, standoffish. I can tell you that the adults are exactly the same way. <laughs> so uh, whenever you tell some, uh, someone you have to do something, it usually it adds a, a layer of like just awkwardness. This is not to mean that, and I put this as a lot of text, but I, it's going on the internet so you can check it there, but I put this here because it's not like other LARPs don't have these elements but it's usually not found in this combination, and especially the thing that you have to do it. Like if you go to a space LARP or you go to a pirate LARP, you do it because you want to go there, not because you have to go there. So what changes when things are mandatory? So I've added a picture of a cute animal uh, <laughs> to remind myself that now I will have a small exercise for you guys. So what I want you to do is work two and two, and this is going to be really sh uh, short, so you'll have like 30 seconds, and discuss of the everything, everyday things you do, like washing or uh, standing up or anything. Like what is it that you dislike the most in the world to do? So two and two, discuss, please go ahead. And you can discuss in your own language if you want. Okay, let me have a couple of examples. Let's start on the back row. What did you discuss? The two of you in the corner there with the green, uh, yes, you who are looking away. Yes, you. Uh, I tried warnings on waking up 
mornings and waking up. And you guys, yes, go ahead. Waking up. Okay, and another one. Cutting nails. Pink. What? Cutting nails. Cutting nails. Oh, wow, that's a good one. Uh, uh, and then? Paying for my transport. Paying for transport. Yeah. Excellent. So now, just to sort of uh, uh, make my point very clear, I'm going to check my slide now if it's a little bit. Yes. So imagine that I come in to your house and tell you, OK, now we're going to have a LARP. It's the nail clipping LARP. We will make you clip nails because it's an important skill to have when you grow up. But now we will clip nails for four hours or we will pay tickets for uh, or we will make you wake up for the entire day. A lot of times. It's not very, you know, a lot of people will have a lot of resistance and go, no, 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 no. And it's the same thing when I come into a business and, and, uh, uh, and a business has bought a communication workshop. And they come in and it's like, yes, but we know how to talk to each other already. <laughs> yes, you do, but you can always get better. It's usually my response. But anyway, so mandatory does that to you. And it also has some implications that you really need to take care of the people that are sitting in front of you. So mandatory is having to be present, even though you don't want to, not necessarily against your will, but also not because it is your burning heart's desire to clip nails, wake up, and buy train tickets. <laughs> so, it's useful to remember that not everyone might like what you're about to give them. Uh, and I will compare this a little bit to Signa. Where are you, Signa? There she is. Signa talked about the medieval battle where you were all dressed up in medieval armor and suddenly the zombies come out. And you go, huh. And again, this is a little bit like with a business. You come into a morning meeting and you, uh, you think you're going to talk about what you're going to do this day. And then, pa -pa, there I am. Hello, we're going to talk about working environment. And then you go, like, go away, you zombie. Right? <laughs> so, I can't even understand what I wrote here. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. What consequences does this have? Usually when I design for uh, uh, EduLARPs or EduLARP-B things, uh, I make sure to have my pressure fader toward pretense. There's uh, a lot of arguments for not, uh, people that have to be there are not very open to hardcore things. So I tend to go for the pretense. And the same thing with, uh, with the openness fader. Uh, people that don't know that they're supposed to do something or why they are there, it's also a good thing to just be honest with them and say, hey, we're going to have a LARP about this and this, and what we try to, to do is you know, shed light on a couple of discussions. And then we will have a debrief and we'll try to, to take care of you. Openness is very good for creating a sense of wanting to do it. And then I've added two more, uh, two more things, that's working on alibis and working on accountability. Um, and I'll break down the alibis in three. Alibis are social, physical, and also content driven. So in this group here, it's easy to make you dance to the, make you, that sounds very harsh. It's easy to do the come on dance because most people here are comfortable with each other and most people you know, know that this is the kind of social context where we do kind of stupid, crazy, silly things like that because it's funny and uh, we feel liberated. So, uh, but if, we, if you do that in a working context, like uh, the last half year I've been working a lot with bankers. Bankers are very serious people. <laughs> so if the first thing you say to them is, hi, good morning, we're now going to do the good morning dance then most of them will leave the room uh, uh, because it's not in their, uh, it's not in their uh, nature to, to do morning dances at the bank. I wish it was because I think it would be a lot more fun to go banking, but that's how it is. Also, there is a physical alibi. Uh, Miriam was talking yesterday about creating small props, you know, uh, for uh, hats for students to, to take on capes, things like that. that. Those actually work with adults as well. Um, you can, uh, you know, uh, if you give someone um, 
you know, like a white lab coat, and you say, you are now the professor of medicine. They'll go, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm now the professor of medicine. Because you allow them, you give them an alibi to be it. Also, in a physical sense. And then, obviously, the content. What are we talking about? What are we working with? These are also things that will give people reasons to participate. Is everything clear so far? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I will then move on to what is accountability. And another cute animal. Oh, that's because I'm going to make you do a terrible exercise. No, um, I'm, I'm joking. Um, now, again, I want you to turn to a person next to you. And if you don't have a person next to you, then, um, you know, find someone. Or make it a three, uh, three and three, or something like that. <laughs> and I want you to discuss the following. It's called Vacation Crisis, and the story goes as follows. Imagine that you've been, um, you've been saving a lot of money because you want to go to a vacation, your dream vacation. You all know where your dream vacation is, right? So you come to the city of your dreams. And then you realize your luggage is gone. <laughs> so you're a bit disappointed, but it's okay because you still have your little bag and you know, it'll be fixed. So you get in the taxi and you come to the hotel lobby and then you discover your little bag is gone too. Holy shit. Has your wallet, it has your keys, it has your password, it has everything except your phone. Your phone is still in your pocket. So now you can discuss, who would you call? <laughs> and most of you will call this person. Yeah. Or your father, statistically speaking. I'm not saying everybody would call their mother or their father, but most people would. Now, I, and, and if there is a wrong translation here, I blame Google Translation. It was good in Vietnamese? Yes! Um, You feel neglected? The people who feel neglected, come to me and we will fix it before we put it on the internet, okay? <laughs> but I'm putting the responsibility on you guys now, because you're adults. Yeah. So come to me and I will correct it. You have until dinner tonight. And then we will, no wait, that's, that's an assholey thing to do because you're in workshops. You have until breakfast tomorrow morning uh, uh, to give it to me. So I will be at the baras and then you can give it to me there. Why? Yes. Safety. Safety. Yes. Other suggestions? Peter? Trust. 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 Solutions. Solutions. <coughs> Empathy. Wisdom. Wisdom. Understanding. 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 Money. Contact. Contact. Organizing skills. Organizing skills. <laughs> Mom is good at organizing you the hell out of Dodge. That's good. All these are wonderful words. Uh, I'm sad I didn't prepare for all of those words to come up, but I have prepared for one of them, and this is this one. But I think most of these words, both wisdom, organizing skills, uh, uh, well, I guess humor as well, even though nobody said it, it comes down to it's a person you actually trust. You think that this person can fix things for you. And that's sort of what you're trying, or at least I am trying to instill into, into the people that I workshop with. And there are some tricks. And I hesitate calling them tricks because it then sounds like you're tricking them into doing uh, stuff. But mostly it's just about being polite and smiling and being a friendly face. Some of you may have noticed I was in the door when we started the lecture. And those are the three things I like for me when I do a workshop. Like those three things are actually kind of important. <coughs> to smile, to say hello to people, and to actually talk to them. And uh, I'll ask you to notice when you're in workshops uh, that you're not running yourselves. How many times people actually forget to do these three things here? And it's interesting. It creates, at least for me, it creates a lot of closer atmosphere. It's easier to ask people to do kumamon dances, to talk to each other, 
because you've already worked a little bit with them. Okay? Good. <laughs> the obligatory cute cat. So when you're doing cute animals, you always have to have a cute cat. So now I'm going to do a demonstration. And will you please give a big round of applause to Jamie, who's now the first 2015 participant on stage. So again, we're going to work two and two. Uh, you're going to do impro story, and it goes. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, it goes like this. So you need to. We, we need to actually stand next to each other. Once upon a time, there was a stick. The stick was sitting on a bench. The bench was very wet. The person sitting on the bench next to the tree was soggy and cold. This is how it goes. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. So everybody, pair up two and two. Every story starts with once upon a time and create a story yourselves. And you don't have to write it down. It's only oral, only oral. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Thank you guys. Was it fun? I saw a lot of smiles, that's good. I heard a bit of laughter as well, that's also good. Now, oh, you can share the stories uh, at dinner time. Uh, but this is also about creation. Now, my question is, why does this work? Why does it work to do a silly exercise? Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Shared responsibility, you're not alone. Shared responsibility, very cool, thank you. We have some shared knowledge, like cultural knowledge of storytelling. Yeah, okay, cool, that's a very cool. You have to actually hear what the other person says to you. You actually have to listen, yeah, okay. In a bigger group, you actually have to engage everyone. Hmm, hmm. okay. I made a short, oh, yeah, so, sorry, yeah, go. Maybe it's not about doing a correct story, but a funny story. Yes, and maybe doing your story as well, and not everybody else's. Hmm. So doing a story, actually, I think. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it doesn't matter that we do, what story we do, it matters that we do it together. Yeah, yeah. cool. And maybe just uh, a bit to make our partners tricky, like to, to make those tricky moments for them. Ah, but you are a little bit of a devil then, I guess. <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> it makes for fun stories. I, I agree. Christopher had a point. You're interested in finding out what happens. You get curious, right? Hmm. These are all story dynamics uh, things. And I, uh, it, I, I actually really enjoy listening to you guys, which is, well, yeah, get you up here. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> and fade into black. So if I were to talk about the mechanics in the room, uh, when it's a, a, a bunch of people that are strangers, this is sort of what I would say. It's an easy-ish task, like there is a lot of mistakes, but it doesn't really matter because it's easy. It's absurd and unexpected, which gives you fun and laughter. You have nothing to lose, really, because you're working two and two, so the uncomfortable sort of like is uh, uh, disseminated a little bit. And uh, hopefully you guys already are a little bit comfortable with each other. Like you know each other already a little bit. And maybe, and hopefully, I'm also able to ask you to do it in a non-stress-inducing way. So these are the kind of things that I at least think about when I'm meeting a new crowd for the first time. Like, what are you... What are you asking them to do, and how are you asking them to do it? I've done the exercise you just did with mechanics, with climbers, with prisoners, with bankers and engineers, and a lot of other uh, uh, work groups as well. And it works pretty much the same way that it did here. It allows people to laugh, it allows people to sort of place, your trust, uh, place their trust in you as a facilitator. So a lot of 
a lot of times when I work with Edularp, I work with these three questions. How do you create trust? How do you maintain trust? And how do you manage trust? And basically, if we're in, you know, the first time uh, I met Yako, we're, it's all the social dance of saying, hi, who are you, and, and, uh, and all of that. And that's the same thing you guys did on Monday and Tuesday. Now, it's easy to go wrong in all of these. <laughs> Uh, uh, like if, uh, if Jocko was sleeping and suddenly I was uh, uh, standing naked uh, across his bed uh, uh, in the middle of the night screaming Rah! The maintaining of trust is very difficult after that. <laughs> it, obviously it depends on Jocko as a person but uh, uh, I would guess it could be a little bit uh, uh, difficult. But also, you know, managing it. How are you, how we're using this trust? Do you want to spend a lot of trust on doing something you think is really cool in a LARP? Or do you maybe want to save that for later? Um, yeah, those kind of considerations you can do. However. <laughs> there are plenty of nice people you should never trust. There are plenty of people you don't call when you're lost in the hotel without money and passports and anything to do. And that's not necessarily because some people are inherently evil or something, but because they think about themselves before they think about you. Uh, and they think about their own projects instead of your project. And they think about maintaining the fiction of the LARP instead of thinking about your well-being. And you are going to be that person, so you can make choices. Do you maintain the fiction of the LARP, or do you maintain the trust and the well-being of your participants? Yes? Um, just how you balance the... Um, we had the opting out and the... Mandatory thing? Yes! yes. As, oh. as in school, because I've always been on, like, you have to do it because you just have to do it. And then yes! And Usually, uh, there is, or no, not usually, there is always the opting out, uh, even though it's mandatory. Uh, what I usually, uh, or what we did with uh, Fong Fong Dog, a prisoner for a day, uh, amongst others, is that we would take the, uh, uh, the people that opted out from the get-go, uh, we would take them into the organizer room and then give them other tasks, sort of observe the others while, while they're out there. So you, you take them out of, of the actual harm's way, uh, uh, so to speak, but you, may, um, you make sure they're part of the program, but on their premises. Did that answer? That's one example. Uh, and we can have, there are more examples. I, I'm, I'm guessing Miriam has a whole host of things she does to, to, uh, to do that. Okay, yeah, it's an excellent question, by the way. And, Exactly the kind of questions you guys should be asking yourselves if you're doing educational LARPs. E actually, even if you're doing the like, not even, also if you're doing regular LARPs. It's good to think about those kind of things. Saying that someone is safe is not the same as them being safe, right? So I can use a lot of time standing here smiling and greeting and talking to people but if I turn out to be an asshole, that's worth nothing, right? So you actually have to make sure that they are safe in action also. Oh, wow. Better. I think Keynote has ruined my graphic on the next one. It works. Um, in my original slide, I will not tell you about my original slide because I cannot let it go. There are three circles overlapping each other. Um, but okay, uh, I will leave it at that. Um, I would say that once you've established trust, there is also a host of things you can and cannot do. I've split them into three spheres. It's the legal, it's the social, and it's the societal sphere. So um, basically, what does the law say? What can we as a, what does we as a group say? And what does the society as a whole say? 
And here I have maybe a crazy example for you to illustrate uh, uh, what I mean by this. So Martin and I were discussing that we wanted to make a LARP about cannibalism. So, uh, oh yeah, okay, we have one participant already. Uh, <laughs> so, on a legal perspective, if you want to make a hardcore, immersive LARP about cannibalism, it's still illegal to go out and hunt people, kill them and eat them, right? So that's a no-go. You shouldn't do that. Oh, <laughs> this is worrying at, at so many levels. But then there is also, uh, uh, there is also, well, you can make a, a group work with, oh, it's a very interesting topic, why would people do that? Mm -hmm, no, let's work with that, right? But then you go to the LARP and uh, you've managed to find, a, uh, uh, to find a mechanism to illustrate human flesh, right? Because, I mean, obviously eating human flesh is a big part of cannibalism. Uh, and as an organizer, you think, ha, huh, it shouldn't be pork or it shouldn't be lamb. No, no, no. Let's get monkey meat. <laughs> That's the closest you get to human flesh. Oh, it will be a very immersive and very powerful LARP. And then you have a wonderful LARP and you go back to your parents and you say, hey, we went to a LARP where we ate monkey flesh. <laughs> your parents will probably not react all that well and wonder who Martin and I are as organizers. Why are you putting our children through eating monkey flesh, right? So uh, those are the kind of things that you probably shouldn't do f because they have consequences in the wider society. But then there is also what we do here as a group, right? As an organizer, uh, let me take the food example. So you're organizing a, a, a LARP in a forest and you've run out of soup. Or that is, you have some meat bouillon. So you can mix that into uh, to the soup and make more soup out of it. Now, do you do that without asking the participants? No, you can't. Exactly, right? Because if there are vegans and vegetarians in your player group, if you don't know that everybody eats meat, right, then uh, you will create yourself a huge trust problem within the group that you're working with. So those are the kind of levels, I would say, uh, for engagement in ethics when it comes to creating LARPs. The things you cannot do, legal, the things you shouldn't do, and I'm not, like lots of LARPs actually sort of probe into things that are problematic in society and they do that uh, uh, to explore them and that's interesting, but still there are things you shouldn't do. And then there are things you need to know why you are doing them before you are doing them. Examples here in, from my professional life. In a workshop, you make sure to design the things you do so people don't hurt themselves. I work a lot with safety culture, and you can imagine what the safety culture program would look like if someone broke their ankle or something during a workshop from dancing too much komamon or something like that. <laughs> it would be very embarrassing for the, uh, for the participant, it would be very embarrassing for me as a facilitator, but not at least it would be devastating for the firm I work for. Um, there's also uh, the, uh, uh, the second uh, level, making uh, uh, colleagues embarrass themselves in front of each other. This turns back to the alibi. What kind of alibis are you giving people to participate? Right? Um, if they can embarrass themselves in front of each other, that's usually something that will make them turn away and not participate. And the last one is actually a thing that I find interesting but it's a huge discussion. Would you allow your participants to fail? Yeah. Hmm. A lot of people would. Depends on the definition of fail. It depends on the definition of fail. Very good, thank you. Depends on what you would like to achieve. Yeah. And some, this goes back to who is it that is paying for what you're doing, right? And I have companies that tell me, no, our participants are not allowed to fail. So then you as an organizer are in the squeeze between listening to the people paying you and to the people playing your game. Those are real life uh, uh, compromises and discussions you need to have both in you, uh, within your organizing group and yourself. 
I'm also going to, uh, I've, uh, I've borrowed two slides from uh, uh, Carolina Dahlberg, who was here last year, but who's not here this year. Uh, but her work is worth checking out. It's, she works for Pedagogisk Centrum, which is right there. So if you look at the slides, then you will find it. Um, she talked last year about the GM player relationship, and I think that's worth mentioning, especially for us as an organizing group. And especially when working with youngsters or people in a vulnerable position. Uh, I would say uh, when I worked in, in the prison outside Bergen, um, I mean, there was a lot of vulnerability going on. Uh, and I have, just by having the keys to the door, I have a lot of power over these people that are in the room with me. And that's a relationship that needs to be taken care of. So you need to consider what are your roles outside the game context? How do you think over your participants? Uh, how, how do you think your participants perceive you as a GM? Uh, I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, if you go to a summer camp when you're 12, a lot of people, uh, and you have a, a, a camp leader who is 22, there is a disproportionate power relationship there already. Now, if the 22 year old is creating a game and asking you to do a lot of crazy stuff, then the 12 year old is more likely to do that. Are you sure you want them to do that? And what affordances does this relationship give you that you normally wouldn't have in a random group of people? Questions worth considering. And there are social roles, formal roles, context of the game, the age and the experience with the format. Like even in this room, I'm given a stage, I'm giving a mic microphone, I'm being taped. That gives me a lot of formalities uh, uh, in the role uh, with you. Now we can try and break that down. Uh, and I try to do that by dancing silly on the stage and do stuff like that. And also saying, uh, uh, wanting you to ask me questions when things are over. But still, they're worth considering. What do I do tonight when I'm at the bars to be a, not be an asshole and grumpy and, uh, and talk to you in a friendly manner? Also, I asked you yesterday, uh, and this is goes to a bit more of the general uh, things of it. Uh, I asked, asked you yesterday about the Stanford Prison Experiment. I would urge you all that are doing working with this to check out Simbardo and Milgram. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, and come and talk to me after. I, I will give you a, a heads up on, on, on what it is. But basically, it's the two experiments in psychology that are world famous for for doing all the bad things to people, uh, <laughs> put very simply. And you shouldn't do them. And after that, that was a whole lot of serious talk, there is a cute hamster. <laughs> Which I think is very symbolic since he's trapped inside a cone and looks a little bit sad. And that's not something you want to do to your participants. Imagine your participants here now. <laughs> So, uh, th that, uh, then I've talked about what is educational LARP, what makes educational LARP a bit, you know, different from regular LARP. I've talked about accountability, and I promised you to talk about shit happens. What are you going to do about shit happening? <laughs> Make it right again. I would divide shit into three categories. <laughs> There is shit that happens because of me and you as an organizer. There is shit that happens because of other people and participants and all those annoying people that don't know what they are doing. And there is shit that happens for no reason. You are still responsible for all of them as an organizer. However, you can counter them by good planning and asking questions for the first one. Asking questions, I cannot stress how important it is to ask questions, both with your own assumptions, but also asking people who have done things before, leaning on them, listening to their uh, experiences. If people make shit happen, it might not be your fault, but you still have to deal with it. I mentioned, oh yeah, you have an example or? No. Give 
Yes, this is true for regular LARP. This is true for regular LARP. Then you have that option. But if you are an educator and you're working within a frame of taking care of participants because they have to be there, then this falls on your head. But it's an excellent clarification. Thank you very much. I'll pause a little bit just to let that sink in. It's an excellent consideration. So, if you're doing, say, prisoner for a day, and a participant comes up and says, I've gotten an SMS that says my mom is in hospital. Do you then say to her, well, you shouldn't have a telephone in here. This is a role play. Go back to your play. Or you take them out, right? So it's not necessarily your fault that the fiction is broken, but you still have to deal with it, right? And then it's a very useful thing to do is the worst case scenario thinking. Uh, this is asking you uh, yourself the questions. What could possibly the, be the worst thing that happened here? <laughs> Referring to the cannibalism uh, uh, LARP uh, that uh, evidently we're doing pretty soon. Uh, then obviously if you found out that there was, oh, it's not monkey meat after all, it is human flesh, oh dear. What's going to happen then, right? The answers to those questions might actually sort of lead you away from making that cannibalism LARP in the first place. Right? I just want to mention the wild hunt. The, the what? The wild hunt. The wild hunt, yes. The movie about LARPing that goes horribly, 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 horribly wrong. And guess what that it should be? It's a very good film tip for anyone who hasn't seen it. The wild hunt. It's from 2009, I think, or something like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, the good thing about worst case scenario thinking is also that it, uh, it trains your capacity to deal with things. So if you've thought through the worst thing that can happen, then if the second worst thing happens, then you already have, like a, uh, uh, you already have um, uh, a mechanism in place. Say for instance that one of the cabins uh, here at Ruta burns down. Now, uh, what do the organizers do? Well, they have participant lists. They would check that everybody is there, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, thinking about those, uh, bo uh, those things also makes you sort of prepared if someone is lost in the forest, which actually happened <laughs> a year or two ago. Uh, uh, but they found, them, uh, found their own way back, but it's still worth thinking about. So. Accountability is about taking responsibility for your uh, participants uh, for all the right reasons. And I put it in there for, a little, it's a little bit fluffy of a sentence, but still, you know, uh, the ethics of it is doing it for the right reasons. So if you're thinking about those things, you are also making an effort to take care of your participants. Accountability is good in all LARPs. Nota bene with, uh, with, you know, you can also choose in, in regular LARPs not to take care of uh, uh, your participants. But it's especially important and also mandatory for you to do in educational LARPs. So? no. This brings me almost to the end. And I'm going to give you two takeaways. My two takeaways for you are these two mental exercises. What are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Are we doing this right? Ask yourself the question, what are we doing? An excessive amount of times when you're organizing things because it will sharpen your mind and it will sharpen you, the people you work with. And you should also think about you know, why but what are we doing? And then I put up the front page test, which is also a very good exercise to do. Now, if we drop a journalist into the middle of our LARP and let them take pictures and write about it and put it on the front page of the biggest newspaper in our country, what will happen tomorrow? So those are the two takeaways. The Easy access tools to make you start think about the accountability issues in LARPs and at your LARPs particularly. Thank you very much. <laughs>